Welcome to What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the FTSE Emerging Markets All Cap China A Inclusion Index um, with net divs in AUD. For the sake of brevity, we'll just refer it to as FTSE Emerging Markets Index. Uh, some people know the ETF that seeks to track the return of this index as Vanguard's VGE, and it's a combination of two indices that include China A shares at an equivalent weighting to qualified foreign investors in China. There's over 4,600 large, mid, and small cap stocks across 24 emerging markets. China, India, and Taiwan are the largest weightings in the index. Your investment philosophy a book we wrote, Shameless Plug, available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say, our intent is educational, not rendering financial advice. Don't make us tap the sign. These are simple concepts. We'd like investors to better understand performance in the short and long term so they can make informed decisions. The periodic performance is nothing outrageously impressive here, and the three-year figure is significantly influenced by the dive in the index after Russia invaded Ukraine. But something to note, with larger indices like the ASX 300, MSCI World, you may achieve a pre-tax return in line or better than the index on some occasions due to securities lending by the manager. I don't know uh, if you know much about this, Peter, but some of these emerging market ETFs in Australia will hold a US-based version of the ETF, which I believe affects tax treaties that Australians would have with those countries. So it's a bit of a tax drag. And so Australian investors will not see these type of returns. They'd probably lose half a percent to management fees and possibly another 0.3 to 0.5 percent in the tax drag. So you're off about a one percent per annum on the index return. If the uh, the structure utilises and utilises foreign domiciled ETFs as as the underlying carrier of the assets and, and those tax treaties that Australia has with other foreign jurisdictions, you know, aren't available to investors, uh, then the tax payable in those foreign jurisdictions, you know, is going to be lost to those investors. So as you say, you know, it might be worth half a percent of the annualised returns, take off the management fees as well, and, and you might have a gap there of 1%, potentially even more. And whilst generally speaking, uh, most investors would expect ETFs to be less expensive than, say, for instance, a managed fund that, that tries to target the same investment opportunities. Uh, if that uh, managed fund uh, is managed in such a way that the tax treaty benefits flow through, that the net cost to the client, inclusive of lost tax benefits, may actually be cheaper in the managed fund. The growth of wealth, similar path to many equities over this period, but heavily influenced by China, more recently India and Taiwan, uh, recovered quite strongly after COVID, but a big sell-off at the top was Ukraine. And subsequently, uh, Russia was actually deleted from the index in 2022. So you know, emerging markets do emerging market things and you can't always expect them to perform the same way as, as developed markets. No, certainly my observations of emerging markets, I probably got first significantly interested in them back around the year 2000, so not far from the start of this chart. And, and the academic research uh, would instruct investors that because they are more volatile and because they are emerging economies and, and you've got new businesses that are starting up and making progress in those jurisdictions, uh, that the returns will be higher, but the volatility will be greater. It's been interesting to observe that the volatility has been very similar to general equity markets over the last 25 odd years, uh, and returns have been somewhat similar, and in fact, just fractionally under developed markets over that period of time, not by such an amount that we could challenge the academic research, but it just proves that emerging markets are more volatile and it's possible for investors to have to experience extended periods where the emerging market doesn't necessarily deliver a premium rate of return. Range of returns. I think it's it's fair to say if we look firstly at the one year time frame, the range between the best and worst is absolutely wider than the developed market uh, and major market indices. So that that certainly validates the notion that the risk reward 
trade-off is wider uh, for emerging markets in search of a premium return over the longer haul. Uh, even the uh, three-year range is certainly wider than the, the major developed markets. Uh, but ironically, as we get right out to the 20-year numbers, um, that, that median return is actually um, very close to developed markets and just a little under. And rolling annual returns. If you compare this to MSCI world, there's periods where there's there's no annual losses where they actually show up in this this index. And most notable was probably 2018, where Chinese markets had a big fall and there were concerns over Chinese growth. And this is what's going to happen. You'll have the largest constituents that influence um, this index. They won't perform in, in lockstep with developed markets. Yeah, there's bound to be variations in periods of both positive and negative returns because the way investors look at the developed world at any given time can be very different to the way they look at the emerging markets. You know, and uh, as you pointed out earlier, you know, for, for Russia to be taken out of the index not all that long ago, you know, suddenly the index is constituted in a very different way to what it had been only just prior to that. So there, there will be quite large variations away from the developed markets from time to time. And you can certainly point to that being another form of diversification in a portfolio. You might say, uh, in, in some respects, Russia being taken out as an active choice. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I guess the uh, behaviours of the Russian leadership have, have led to them being expelled from that index. More broadly for Russia, their behaviours have led them to being denied access to capital markets more, more generally uh, as a result of their socio-political stance with respect to Ukraine. Historic chance, positive and negative, and pretty much what you'd expect to see. It's kind of granular with, with most of the equity markets. It'll, it'll range between 60 to 70% in that range. This chart is so similar in its principles to when we've looked at developed markets or even just the Australian market or even just the US market. The longer you hold emerging markets for, the less chance there'll be of a bad result. The longer you hold them for, the greater chance there'll be of a sound and acceptable result. It's it's really the same for all equity markets. The largest fall in time and recovery. Yeah, I, my recollection is that this is a very similar period to uh, what we've looked at previously for developed markets. And basically, it occurred at the same point in time. It's probably maybe a bit more of a V and then probably flattens out a bit in the two thousand and mid-2011s. Yeah, but it, it, it still... Rep, it still uh, identifies a double dip like we saw with mm. the developed markets. And, and I think that uh, the 86 months uh, period from high to high here is only a couple of months different to the emer to the developed markets. Probably brings up some bad memories there too. Uh, if you've just come out of a 43% dip and then a couple of years later, you start sliding down again. It, it was certainly challenging for any investor, uh, but eventually those that were patient got rewarded. And risk return or efficient frontier. Well, it's important what? to recognise that that we've got a twenty year period here, mm. and as much as most people will think twenty years is long term, um, if we had the data available and, and we could show a forty year chart, I suspect that it would look somewhat different, and the emerging market returns would certainly still be every bit as volatile as this shows, but the average return would probably be quite a bit higher, referring mostly uh, to what I'd call anecdotal evidence and my recollections of the period from 1984 to 2004. But my recollection of that period was that emerging markets did experience much stronger returns that might change the shape of this uh, chart if it, would, if it could be done over a 40 year period. And sources and descriptions of data. Thanks for your time. Okay, bye for now.